Oh, that's smooth right there. That's smooth as butter, baby. <laughs> oh, that's smooth. Oh my god. <laughs> Just because this shit feels so good now. Look, look at that. Oh my god. Out of here. Oh, that feels so damn good. After that entire first playthrough with Axel, that felt good. Streets of Rage 4 is a fantastic love letter to the series and a great successor to the first two games. It brings bright and stylish visuals, crunchy hard hitting gameplay, an updated soundtrack boasting some great new melodies, and some cool new updates to the classic Sega beat em up formula. It all culminates in a game that feels absolutely sublime to play. And with every extra it packs under its hood, even series veterans owe it to themselves to experience this entry in every which way it can be experienced. To my surprise and amazement, the game is even getting universally high praise from all corners of the gaming industry, which seems particularly starved for mainstream beat em up titles. All that said, my biggest takeaway as a fan of the previous games is that it should have taken more lessons from Streets of Rage 3, as well as the fan made game Streets of Rage Remake. But let's go ahead and get into all that by first talking about how number 4 updates the series. I'll start with the story. It's now 10 years after the events of Streets of Rage 3, a game made in the 90s which took place during that same era, placing this game at some time during the early 2000s, likely 2004. The in-game profiles let us know that a retired Axel Stone has been in the wilderness honing his skills and looking for a type of strength that surpasses his fist. I myself don't exactly know what this means, but I'm not exactly a martial arts master either. While Blaze Fielding, on the other hand, was dishonorably discharged from the force some time ago for refusing to take anger management, after she struck the shady police commissioner, who appears as a boss in the game, over an ethical disagreement. However, despite being a civilian dance instructor these days, Blaze still keeps her ear to the ground, keeping up to date with the latest dealings in the criminal underworld. She's learned of a new criminal organization that's making moves and begins to sniff around eventually reaching out to her old friend, colleague, and partner, Axel. Axel leaves his self-imposed isolationist training with no hesitation to join his old friend Blaze. Together, they set out to clear the streets and call up Dr. Gilbert Zahn, the scientist who used to work for the evil syndicate. After a run-in with the syndicate, Zahn had been enhanced with high-grade cybernetics and had made several breakthroughs with Rakushin Energy, a highly volatile and potent energy that was prone to weaponization by Zion himself as well as the Syndicate. Zion used it for self-defense while the Syndicate used it to terrorize Wood Oak, killing 30,000 people in a single Rakushin bomb blast in Streets of Rage 3. Zion's defection to Blaze's team had helped them greatly in their last encounter with the Syndicate, in which they finally put an end to Mr. X and his destructive machinations once and for all. This time, Blaze's meshes never reached Zahn, but instead went to his young apprentice, Floyd Irea, whose profile states that he lost both of his arms in an accident. Floyd had hopes that insurance compensation would come from his employer, 
but they proved to be more concerned with covering their own hides legally than covering Floyd's medical expenses. In an act of compassion, Dr. Zahn reached out to Floyd and offered to help him. Zahn eventually helped replace Floyd's lost limbs with highly advanced mechanical prosthetics, similar to his own cybernetic enhancements. Floyd, now Zahn's research partner, has stepped up to fight in his mentor's place. Floyd himself being a lot younger than Zahn is, anyway. And finally, we have Cherry Hunter, who has lived in the shadow of her highly decorated father, Adam Hunter, her whole life. Cherry joined Blaze's team as well, inheriting Adam's aptitude and disposition for bare knuckle brawling. And while she isn't as just as minded as her father, instead of focusing on her own musical talent, she still heeds the call to action to clean up her city. Together, these four set out to clean the streets, with everyone's motives accounted for except for Cherry's. Like her uncle, Cherry seems to have also been asked to join Blaze and Axel's fight, though in her case, she at least looks to be an adult or near enough to it, whereas before the team went the Batman route and decided it was okay to let a child fight criminals, freaks, robots, ninjas, terrorists, and brains and jars alongside them. Either way, Axel and Blaze seem to think that they absolutely need someone with Hunter blood on the team, perhaps as a good luck charm. And to be fair, the team hasn't been killed yet, so maybe there's something to that. Plus, the Hunters are absolute prodigies when it comes to combat. From there, we tear through location after location and boss after boss to find out the true cause of all this criminal activity. Along the way, we meet many familiar faces, as well as a ton of new ones, until our final showdown with a pair of villains hell-bent on controlling the city like a certain long-departed Mr. X. The story is overall set up in a much more plain way than even the classics. Most of what I just relayed to you was gleaned through reading the character bios from the main menu. The narration gives you a bare bones starting point for the adventure in about as many words as the first game did. Which is a shame because there have been a lot of changes to the Streets of Rage universe including the addition of Floyd and Cherry as well as our new antagonists. It is certainly a step back from how Bare Knuckle 3 and Streets of Rage 3 presented their opening cutscenes. Presentation wise is also a step back from how number two did things. I have to say that it's even a step back from how number one did things, and I'll tell you why. In the first game, the text easily describes how bad the syndicate is and how they have changed the city. In the same few paragraphs, it conveys the motivations for the three playable characters, how they're impacted by the events leading up to the game, how they're connected with one another, and what they're willing to do to change things. It does all that with 81 words. Number 4 with 88 words just does not give you that same degree of setup, and leaves you with more questions than anything, such as, why Cherry, a musically inclined high schooler, will become a vigilante? In number two, we learned that Skate joined the team because his brother was captured and he wanted to help. There is no such setup for Cherry here, not even in her bio. And what's more, we don't understand the motivations of her or Floyd, and we're just told that Floyd is Zahn's apprentice. Again, without going into the extras menu and reading his bio, we don't know much about him. Another question one might have is why Zahn and Skate aren't in this. Number two established why Adam wasn't around, though number three never tells us why Max didn't help. So I guess it's not so consistent in the series. Perhaps a character specific opening before or after the setup cutscene will give each character a proper setup. Kind of like a fighting game does. Even though this game doesn't really rely on the story too much, I think um, at least that sort of setup would help get people more invested in the characters, I would say. And my last comparison between the openings of number one and number four is in how they end. This here sums up the emotions provided by each opening. Number one ends with an impactful statement that makes players instantly feel the importance of the upcoming battle. It reads, they are willing to risk everything, even their lives, on the streets of rage. Willing to risk everything. That tells you all you need to know about what this means to them. In comparison, number four just sounds like a generic Saturday morning cartoon commercial. It reads, together, these four vigilantes stand against the Y Syndicate on the streets of rage. Which is fine, but there is no character connection and no emotion elicited from this. 
This could describe any do-gooder, but it does include us in on what this means to the characters involved. And that is why the bare bones approach to storytelling works for number one, but not for this game. Again, they should have taken a more modern approach or should have offered better explanations to events leading up to this game. And getting back to the events of this game, after some brief narration done in the classic text scroll popularized by Star Wars as well as the first game in this series, we dive head first into the first level. And here, it's a complete treat to hear the song They're Back by series composer and designer Yuzo Koshiro. It certainly brings forth a powerful wave of nostalgia and is the perfect way to start this game, especially when using Blaze, Axel, or Adam, the classic trio, as it's a nice callback to the songs of the original games. After punching out your first few waves of classic enemies and learning many of the new mechanics, you're off and running. Every blow to these enemies feels crisp and perfectly bone crunching. I started with my boy Axel and was treated to some silky smooth multi-hit uppercut combos, a sick string of face breaking attacks that sent the enemies flying, a dazzling flurry of unique special attacks including a damn near screen clearing star move, and a deadly ground shaking back slam that did a lot of splash damage to nearby enemies. Everything Axel has and every way he attacks feels absolutely incredible. The only thing I could rap about with him was his lack of movement options, like the roll and run he used to have in Streets of Rage 3. But after learning more about the game and seeing some experts play it, I see that this isn't an absolute necessity to make the most of Axel's playstyle. For me it is a bit of a necessity because it aims with the game's feel. For me the game just feels stiff without additional movement options. This is especially felt when there are no enemies on screen and you're just walking. At that point it feels like you're controlling a tank, which makes sense for Floyd but doesn't for Axel or Blade. And if you guys can see here from the Streets of Rage 3 gameplay I'm showing, you see that I made a lot of use of movement with characters like Dr. Zahn and Axel. Each of the classic enemies remain as annoying as ever, with Garcia coming in with quick jabs and running knife stabs with outraged hitboxes, Donovan is not letting you jump near them ever before later getting the ability to throw weapons, and Signal sliding in and grabbing you from out of nowhere. Everything at this point feels familiar to someone who's played previous entries in the series, and yet even with those familiar trappings, it still feels fresh and new thanks to the upgraded visuals, as well as the new mechanics, moves, new levels, and overall feel of the game. And once we transition from the third part of the four part stage, the music changes from the nostalgic and upbeat to something new, creepy, and laid back called Chill or Don't. And here we are introduced to a brand new enemy type, some laid back looking dude with his hands in his pockets. This guy proves to be a handful with his kicks and headbutts, reminding me of that nonchalant and sloth like fan favorite wrestler, Orange Cassidy. It is a fantastic transition from old to new and this continues throughout the rest of the level, culminating in a fantastic boss battle with my favorite boss in the game, D.Va. Not only does D.Va have the best theme song in the game, one that I have played on repeat every day since the game has come out, but she also has a ton of personality, a great design, and a swagger that matches the song Overflow by Ground is Lava perfectly. D.Va has a snake that attacks at her command and can channel electricity through it to attack the player. Her attacks have a good range and a wide area of effect. She is a great boss to use to introduce the players to the new mechanics of the game. Her fight offers no overt tutorials, but it's here that players learn that button mashing will not get them very far. Try to button mash against D.Va and she'll quickly drain you of all your credits. It's a much different sort of challenge, unique from the fights with the earlier moves of the game. You see, D.Va possesses a high degree of hyper armor when she attacks meaning once she decides to attack, there's very little you can do to stop her. As a matter of fact, she seems to be using it more often than not as she pursues you, and that's a trend you'll see for most of the bosses in the game, as well as some of the normal enemies and mini bosses. When enemies project a white glow, only a star move, or death, yours or theirs, will stop their next attack. But the player may opt to avoid the oncoming armored attack as well once they've learned it. The battle with D.Va sets the tone for this, and so if you can't get past her, you definitely won't make it past the boss for the next stage. Well, literally, but figuratively as well, as you won't possess the skills needed. And this new system of hyper armor and its frequency is one of my main frustrations with the game, but we'll get to that later. 
And when I say later, I actually mean now, because stage 2 pumps up that frustration with new enemies who abuse hyper armor and grab priority. I will say that much of this frustration is alleviated while playing co-op. I've seen a pair of players not even half as skilled as I was tear through all the enemies that I struggled with, which makes me think that normal mode wasn't completely balanced for multiplayer. And yes, I did struggle initially with normal mode because I was using Axel. But uh, afterwards, um, the other difficulties until Mania mode were fairly... They felt, they felt fairly good. Um, Mania mode felt crazy because again, I was playing a Streets of Rage 3 Axel. But um, every other difficulty felt pretty, pretty good once I got used to the game. Um, one of the enemies I mentioned is a cop named Murphy, who literally carries a shield constructed of light, aka hyper armor. This shield takes more than a full combo to break. Murphy will also interrupt your combos with his frequent baton attacks unless you move. When you're not attacking him, his shield regains full defensive power over time, and rather quickly. Once you take down the first of these enemies, the game likes to throw them at you two and four at a time, many times with other annoying enemies joining them, such as that damn taser wielding officer jackpole. This annoying idiot can slide across like 70% of the screen with a grab that beats most other things other than ranged attacks and invincibility. On harder difficulties like Mania, it's even worse. I've developed some ways of dealing with him, but he's never not annoying. Streets of Rage has always been a series that's expertly balanced itself on a tightrope of cheap frustration versus challenge, or rather enemy strength versus player character strength. This is the first game that clearly tilts its scales to side with the enemy. Enemies are given all manner of advantages while players have the bare essentials, even having to return to the use of health points to use special attacks, with enemies being able to spam them at will. Enemies are also experts at reading player inputs, and even on the normal difficulty use this knowledge to attack you when you're most vulnerable. They are incredibly good at it, more so than any other fighting game or beat em up. It's to the degree that you can hardly exploit their behaviors because they properly read and judge spacing as well. Donovan and his ilk, for instance, know the pixel perfect frame to land their anti air uppercuts. There was never a situation for me to bait them into this move, which could leave them vulnerable because they would only use it in instances where it was about 99.9% .9 safe to do so. And they seem to know the spacing for each character too. Not only that, but as you crank up the difficulty, it becomes clear that enemies know the frames of animation that the player is most vulnerable in. Much of the player's HP is lost from these eagle-eyed mooks patiently waiting and maneuvering around for sneaky blows to the back of the head, or even to the front as they read the recovery frames of your attacks, much better than you do. On hard, hardest, and mania mode, most of the lives I lost came from these death by a thousand cut scenarios. Each enemy, in a way, is like a mini SNK style boss reading your inputs, and responding in kind. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. My least favorite include the ladies from Streets of Rage 3 who abuse drop kicks, the biker women who are outrageously cheap, and the Muay Thai fighters who are named after birds. But don't get me wrong, every enemy has or will likely piss you off. On different difficulties, different enemies annoy me well, differently. Initially for me, it was simply the taser cop, the commissioner, and those bomb throwing anarchists. Once I acclimated to the challenges of the game and pursued higher difficulties, it switched to the first three I listed. The women who abuse drop kicks, for instance, are daily accurate with that attack, and usually attack you in groups of three or more. You can usually only beat the drop kick with a move that renders you invulnerable, or by already being in the air ready to attack before they can even jump. Even trying to avoid it is perilous, as these women can adjust their trajectory in mid-air to a ludicrous degree. Every instance where I baited the attack and moved above or below it to a different plane had me getting hit by it. Of course, once the player commits to a jump, there is no way they can adjust that in mid-air, so these ladies have a natural advantage over the player, especially in numbers, where they continue to spam this god-awful move. I won't spend too much time on the Muay Thai guys, but they like to beat you to the punch with rapid kicks, and their jumping knees horizontal range is just ridiculous. I've been hit with it more times than I care to admit, because it looks like it should have been done ages before it is. They usually come at you in large numbers as well, but the most annoying thing about them is that they can block. On Mania mode, they come at you in extremely large groups, which combined with their blocking, makes timing any sort of combo strings very difficult. 
especially with shorter limb characters like Axel on the Dreaded Stage 9. What's more, it's another thing the enemy can do that the player cannot. You cannot blame the new developers for this as these annoying enemies have always been able to block. But I can blame them for putting so many of these assholes in mania mode. My last normal mode enemy spotlight goes to what I like to call the biker bitches. These fun sized balls of rage and pettiness run the gamut of Streets of Rage 4 bullshit. They have all sorts of hyper armor, an attack range that doesn't make sense, abilities the player doesn't have such as attacking you when you're prone, mini boss length health bars, and they come at you in waves. Not only that, but each of their attacks can bounce you around to other biker bitches. A group of them have juggled me to death on multiple occasions, especially in that damn barbin boss fight. Their charge attack can traverse just about the whole screen and diagonally to boot. They tend to use it from off screen, one of the only enemies in the game to do so. This attack can bounce you off walls for more damage, and as long as you're in the air, which you are if you're hit by this, then other enemies can continue to juggle you. I won't dwell on these enemies because believe me, I really really could. But I'll just say that they put them in some very unfortunate areas. Now continuing my hyper armor rap for the bosses. Of course all of the bosses have it now, but worse than that is that they rely on it. This was never a problem in the old games. Back then the enemies relied on impressive movesets and unique movement patterns. In some ways it was like punch out. Bidding bosses in Streets 1 for instance, require pattern recognition to figure out the most opportune times to attack. That is still the case, but now the devs are in more control of when you should be attacking. To me, I see this as an uncreative solution to making the bosses more difficult, and to me it comes off as a little lazy. This is especially so when you consider the long line of tricky and creative Streets of Rage bosses, starting from the very first game. I remember the first time I fought Solid in Streets of Rage 1, and discovered that jumping in against him was nearly impossible due to his special ability. So I find out that staying on the top plane and forcing him to meet me up there, or descending towards him without jumping was the way to go. Then I got brave later and found out that you could just punch him out with Blazer Axel, despite his range advantage. In this way the game emphasized movement and spacing, and this was his way of teaching that and preparing me for the challenges to come. That's why, despite being as old and dated looking as it is, Streets of Rage 1 plays so incredibly well to this day. The series has only continued to embrace the fundamentals that this game put down more and more. Number 2, 3, and Remake sought to expand on that formula with bosses like Big Bear, Shiva, Yamato, and even that annoying nugget head Jet. But in many ways, 4 does alter those fundamentals. In some ways, those changes are fun and interesting like the new emphasis on combos, but the extensive enemy hyper armor is distinctly un Streets of Rage, and is just plain weird in action. Before enemies such as Shiva would beat you out with moves that made them seem invulnerable and put them at great advantage, but it made more sense in the context of a street fight, because that's how people fight. They bob and weave to avoid danger, then throw out powerful attacks when it's at an advantage. Four opts to give us more situations where the bad guys just stand around taking attack after attack. If we were to equate this with the world of pro wrestling, previous Streets of Rage bosses were fantastic at selling the pain of player attacks, where Streets of Rage 4 bosses possess Ultimate Warrior and his match with Triple H levels of care for your attacks. If that's not a reference that means anything to you, you should probably already be loading up that YouTube clip, because it's worth the watch. But if you're adamant about not watching it, I'll put it like this. Unless you're using hyper armor or star moves, these bosses aren't flinching when in Ultimate Warrior glow mode. It's almost like punching an android in the face. This approach works for certain bosses like Max, the Commissioner, and even Estelle because they're huge and kind of slow. It doesn't work for an agile kickboxer like Barbin. Barbin is actually the perfect character to conclude this point with because he is also a boss in older games. Two in Remake specifically. In those games, Barbin was also an annoying bastard. His slicing kick had good range and he could stuff most of the player's normals and jump ins. He also had periods of quick and deceptive movement patterns he used to confuse and close in on the player, and once there he had an ungodly throw range that could put the third strike meta to shame. He was annoying for sure, 
but even so, certain characters, mostly the ones with really good range, could crush him. And once you figured out his patterns, it made for a much more fun fight, where you mostly had him at your mercy. At this point, it was well deserved, as you would increase your level of skill to outstrip his BS. Barb in the Streets of Rage 4 is nothing like that. Now he ballerina toys around the arena cloaked in hyper armor. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, you really don't have much to fear from him even with the excessive hyper armor. But the devs do throw a plethora of biker bitches at you too. Enemies who also abuse hyper armor and who frequently combo with Barbin, as well as the wall, each other, and even the ground to rob you of all your lives. In Barbin's previous fight, he also had mooks you had to deal with, but they were easily dispatched at the start of the fight and there was no doubt that he was the main threat. In the new fight, they bombard you with mooks, with a few who were just introduced to be mini boss tier with lengthy health bars to boot. What's even worse is that they continue to come at you throughout the fight if you break the motorcycles, which most players end up doing without realizing it. The only boss fight in the original series that spawned mooks like this was the Streets of Rage 3 jet fight, which was without a doubt the most annoying fight in that game. Even the Mr. X fights in the first two games at least had the decency to give these mooks low HP, but thankfully, unlike the jet fight, the barbin ads do eventually stop appearing or won't appear at all if you don't break the bikes. Once that's done, barbin is basically laughable. I think they got rid of his throw in this one because he never used it on me, even in mania mode. Admittedly, his throw range and priority was previously annoying, at least until I learned how to land on my feet. But the fact that he's so tame that he needs all his attacks to have hyper armor just to pose a threat to you in a one-on-one -on -one fight speaks volumes about the boss design of this game. This is something that struck me in the face when I watch other people play through it on co-op, even people less skilled than myself, and I'm no Streets of Rage guru. They tore through the bosses that I struggled with because they had twice the opportunities to attack while the boss was vulnerable, and were able to do at least twice the damage through combos. And in the classic Streets of Rage way, they are able to control the flow of combat by owning more screen real estate. I think the bosses were likely designed with this concession in mind. It makes me think that the game even a solo run of the story mode was balanced for two players instead of one. I'm not sure if this is true, but to me certain parts felt like it, especially some of the bosses. I have yet to play co-op, but from what I've seen the enemy placement seems the same, as does the number of enemies. I'm not sure about HP and damage though. But given all that, and all the advantages given to the enemies over the player, such as the ability to block, slide and adjust jumps in midair, as well as the sheer number of enemies. I think the ability to run and roll or to simply dash should have been given to every Streets of Rage 4 character other than perhaps Floyd. It's telling that both Cherry and Adam have versions of this and are made more fun by it. Blaze is so good that she doesn't necessarily need it, but could still benefit from it. But it does feel distinctly absent from Axel's repertoire. Maybe it's just me because I'm a fan of all the changes introduced in Bare Knuckle 3, but overall that's where my gripes for this game come from. Why take out movement options that made the game flow so well? I had to admit it felt like a step back. That was until I played as Cherry Hunter, who was indeed the spiritual successor to her fast and nimble Uncle Skate. To me, Cherry emphasizes what Streets of Rage 4 is supposed to be and the potential to where the series is going after this. She can use multi-hit combos in the air, can bounce off enemies' heads, run around them, has plenty of setups for juggles and stuns, and even has an infinite combo loop. She feels like a refreshing new take on the series, whereas Axel and Blaze, while maintaining an interesting and fun to use playstyle, feel out of place in comparison. Now that I think about it, this was likely done on purpose to make them feel slightly out of touch, like relics lost to time. These older versions of them have learned some new tricks, just enough to keep up with things, but they are still products of their era. Thematically, that's an awesome statement to make and was successfully pulled off because that's exactly what their gameplay feels like. No words are necessary to convey that, but honestly, that's not fair because Bare Knuckle 3 is a thing that happened. Dr. Zahn being referenced and showing up in the end as well as Rue's appearance in the bar lets us know that that game wasn't retconned. As such, reverting them to Streets of Rage 2 style movement just feels out of step with how the characters have previously evolved it becomes especially redundant when you unlock Streets 1 and 2 versions of those characters. It's then made painful when you unlock the Streets 3 versions and see the options that they lost over the years.
One other feature that was lost from number 3 to number 4 was the special gauge. This gauge acted as a buffer and cooldown for special attacks, allowing you to perform them for free when the gauge was full, with them costing HP as per Streets 2 when the gauge was still building. Admittedly, that's been replaced with a more interesting risk reward system in Streets 4, similar to Bloodborne's regain system, but I feel the cooldown gauge could still have its place here to add another layer of strategy to the game, and an additional advantage for the player, who is already outmanned and outgunned during solo play, especially on harder difficulties. I don't think a free special here and there breaks the game in any way, it doesn't disincentivize players from using the new systems, since they're useful for getting the best possible grades on each stage. All the gauge does is give the player some safe breathing room from annoying enemies such as the mooks and the bosses like Barbin, who are just lathered in hyper armor and adds. But yeah, those are my gripes. And even with all those, I still love this game, and feel it has a unique place in the series. I like what it's added in terms of style and presentation, and I do enjoy the ways it's evolved the series gameplay, such as with Floyd, Adam, and Jerry. So overall, when it comes to my likes, I actually love the cartoony visuals, which fits Streets of Rage quite well as the series has always felt like a grim and gritty American style cartoon. The new art style fits that perfectly. Like in Remake, I would have also enjoyed more grit and blood, but I don't think it's necessary to immerse yourself into this visually stimulating world. We get all manner of urban landscapes in this one, from graffiti covered streets, to vibrant TMNT looking sewers, to a biker bar, to high rise office buildings, and even some not so urban ones like White Island. What also gives these locations a memorable feel is the updated soundtrack, which is absolutely incredible. Featuring artists like Ground is Lava, Yuzo Koshiro, and Motohiro Kawashima as previously mentioned, as well as Olivier de Riviere, who I am familiar with thanks to his awesome work on Don't Nice Remember Me, another great beat em up in its own right. Olivier also did many of my favorite tracks in this game, such as The Undergrounds, Child Time, and 25 Years Ago. Others include XL Middleton, Keiji Yamagishi, Harumi Fujita, Yoko Shimomura of Kingdom Hearts fame, Scattle, with one of my favorite tracks in this game, Maximum, which for me is Max Lunder's theme song, and Das Mortal. I think the new music fits nicely, even within a series known for its Pantheon of Godly tracks. It's not really the same as the older stuff, which I admittedly hold in high regard, but I don't think it needs to be. I was surprised to learn that many people didn't and still don't like the experimental music of Streets of Rage 3, but I loved it. I don't mind if a game does its own thing, even if the music isn't what's expected. I know that music can greatly heighten the gaming experience or dampen it if seemingly out of place, but for me none of the music in the series is out of place. As a matter of fact, I consider it one of the premier series when it comes to music, thanks to Koshido and Kawashima's musical passion. Streets of Rage is one of the select few series where its music is even more heralded and influential than its gameplay. As an art form, Streets of Rage was no doubt elevated by its soundtracks. I think that's a major part of what's connected me to the series on such an emotional level, along with its urban imagery. After hearing the classic ending theme on completion of Streets of Rage 3, I was no doubt bonded spiritually and emotionally to this series. Great art can do that to you. And the music in these games, along with the superb pixel art and grounded weight of the gameplay, all contribute to elevating these games to great art slash masterpiece status. Outside of that, I love how much faster paced this is than Streets of Rage 2. My guess is that it's the one that the devs took the most inspiration from, and while most consider it the best in the series, I just do not. From a soundtrack perspective, perhaps, and Max is indeed an immensely fun character to use, as is Sammy slash Skate. For me, however, I find much more enjoyment in the faster pace and simplicity of the first game, as well as the wealth of combat options, branching paths, breakneck story, and wired cast of playable characters, including the many that are hidden in and of Streets 3. I think number two may overall have the best bosses in hindsight. Then again, that's a tough one that'll take more discernment from me because the first three games all have some absolutely banging boss fights. Regardless, this game cranked up the pace considerably, and I enjoyed that. And the combat feels just as crunchy as it ever has. If it wasn't for that enemy hyper armor, I could easily say that this has the most satisfying feel to the combat in the entire series. But the other games are just a bit more consistent in that regard. There's a few quality of life changes to the original formula that really do elevate this game 
including the simple act of mapping the item pickup function to its own dedicated button. No longer do you have to fumble with picking up a weapon or food item when you're about to punch an enemy's face off. That takes out a major annoyance I had with the first two games specifically. Oh, I didn't want to pick that up. Ah, oh, let me get away from this stuff. That's the only thing about this game that I don't really care for is the um the weapon thing, weapon system. Most of the time I get hit trying to pick up weapons or put them down or something. Come on. I didn't want that. Oh, really? Just out of the blue, eh? Stop it! Uh... The next change for me is huge, as it's always been a prime annoyance of mine throughout the entire series, and a massive source of time-wasting filler. And that is the fact that enemies in Streets of Rage 4 cannot hide off screen. Previously, they could bob in and out of the sides of the screen that you were stuck in, making them functionally untouchable. A few wouldn't even come out of their hidey hole unless your back was turned towards them and you were several paces away. It's one of the most frustrating things to deal with when you go back to play older titles, because many of those enemies would abuse this and just waste your time. And kudos to the devs for letting this old series staple die in the past like it's meant to. Its omission keeps the flow of this game mostly fast paced. The wealth of modes such as a separate arcade experience, battle and gallery modes also keeps things interesting along with the various difficulty arrangements. While this game doesn't have the wealth of customization options like the remake, it does have some really cool ones that affect the visuals drastically. There is even a button mapping option. Thank goodness. I use default controls, but it's always nice to see this made available. Another disappointment was the fact that every character shares the exact same story mode, with each defaulting to Axel being the one to take and ride Barman's stolen motorcycle from the bar to Chinatown, regardless of who's being used. The only other story gripe that I have is with the plot being overall feeling uh, more cartoony than necessary thanks to Mr. X's anime inspired brats being the main villains. The transitions from scenario to scenario are fantastic, but I feel the game could have ended more satisfactorily. It falls a little flat because the Y twins are just not compelling villains. They come off just as flat as the Klepso twins did in Borderlands 3. And this could be changed. One of three changes could have improved things by a great deal. My recommendations are as follows. Starting with number one. Since the game already makes copious use of Mr. X's imagery, has his legacy at the forefront, they could have brought him back near the end for the old bait and switch. As trite as that is, it wouldn't be anywhere near as trite as what Streets 3 did by putting his brain in a jar and making him the mastermind behind an army of robot duplicates. His return would make more sense here and would be far more impactful than it was in Streets 3. Then we have number two. They could have aged up the designs of both Mr. Y and Mrs. Y, as well as their personalities for more favorable opponents to match Axel and Blaze. They could have even made them specifically fixated on killing those two for killing their father. This would have been the preferred direction to go, as it would result in a much more compelling villain overall for both characters, but also keep the game's tone more in line with the rest of the series. Streets of Rage has always felt more like a gritty action movie than a cartoon. And finally, we have number three. They could have just made a whole new villain, just as evil and deranged as Mr. X, but with a new design and distinct aims for the city. Maybe it could have been someone from Axel, Adam, or Blaze's past. It could have just been someone from the Syndicate, such as Sheila, or some other corrupt businessman growing into the role as a new boss. Definitely a missed opportunity, because they could have taken this in any direction. But other than that, I quite enjoy the transition cutscenes used to open and end each level, as well as the environmental storytelling each level used and the bosses chosen. The final boss, which I can only describe as a spider tech tank thing, uh, could have used more thought though. 
I think the designs could have connected it more to the series legacy, much more than it did. Advanced robotics were present throughout the story and design of Streets 3, but the design for the spider mech, tank, mech, spider tech mech, tex mech, tech skin, uh, thing, was straight out of Metal Slug or Mega Man. Streets 3 had plenty of tech for them to riff on and expand to make the last fight resemble a Streets of Rage fight more than it did. But then again, everything about their white twins screamed anime, even their goofy spider tech, Texan Mexican thing. As is, the twins are fine designs, as is their mech, but it just doesn't feel like the final boss material for a Streets of Rage game. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what they call a nitpick. While the boss design isn't to my liking, um, it's nothing really wrong with it. Um, it is definitely different for the Streets of Rage series, to be honest, but yeah, it's perfectly fine, serviceable. I do still kind of stand um, with the idea that this game, uh, and you can see with the boss design, is a lot less gritty than previous games. Um, as you saw, Robot Y had a much more kind of gritty, like American military design, but this one uh, just feels more cartoonish, something like something out of Astro Boy or um, Mega Man, like I said before. So. Yeah, just dropping this um, addendum to my previous opinion. I didn't want to shit on the boss too hard because <laughs> it's a pretty fine design. It's just not to my liking, and it feels like it does feel like it's kind of out of step with previous um, previous uh, boss designs. But I don't think it's goofy. I just think it's different. So overall, I find Streets of Rage 4 to be a worthy addition to the amazing pantheon of Streets of Rage games. I appreciate much of what it adds to the series and hope much of it sticks around for future installments. The two new characters add a lot to the series and are a good indication of where I see future gameplay mechanics heading. The game feels fantastic, sounds fantastic, and looks fantastic, and it has one of the largest rosters of playable characters for a mainstream beat-em-up, with nearly every retro callback in the series present. Streets 4 proves to be a stellar successor to the first two games, but is honestly lacking in many key areas compared to Streets of Rage 3 and Streets of Rage Remake. Remake, with all the fan passion driving it, presents a high bar to climb, especially with all the tweaks the player can access to craft their perfect Streets of Rage experience. But I do believe that the new game could have learned a ton more from Streets 3 and evolved it from there. Regardless. Streets of Rage 4 provided a sublime experience and elevated the beat-em-up genre above the standard button mashing affair to something more strategic and satisfying. I have no problem saying that I love this game and appreciate all the love and hard work that was poured into it. It especially shows how much the developers at .emu, Lizard Cube, and Guard Crush Games cared about it. I'm looking forward to a follow-up, whether it be in DLC form or a new game. That'll be awesome. I'm even hearing the rumblings of a patch being in the works, something very drastic that'll change how we all feel about the game. Until then, I'll see all of you on the Streets of Rage, which is across from Bare Knuckles Lane, from what I've heard. I think it's down the road from Final Fight Drive in uh, Double Dragon County. Anyways, peace out everybody. they call in the industry a false finish because I do have some last minute ramblings for you guys uh, first and foremost this video was written about uh, about three months ago when the game first came out maybe like a couple of weeks after the game came out it is uh, July 17th now so I'm super duper late with this review and yeah um, the first thing the first challenge I had with this thing was actually getting the audio clips recorded, um, which is not easy when you stay in an apartment to get uh, consistent audio recorded. And the thing is, I decided to go with a script for this review to make it a little bit more professional. And it actually kind of did the opposite because the script made me sound very robotic, uh, which I do not appreciate. Um, or I should say, I sounded very robotic in the way I read the script, uh, probably due to the way I wrote the script. So. 
um, it was my first time uh, using a script for a review. So that was something. Um, but yeah, this is my first time using it in a review format. So it was a little bit, a little bit weird. Um, and I didn't get to record the whole script at once. Uh, so some of the clips sound, they have a different pitch to them. But anyway, that's Insider Baseball. Um, other things I wanted to address about this review, some of the points I made, I don't think they came off too clearly. Um, the first thing uh, is with the Streets of Rage art style. Um, it's definitely always been cartoony, but I just wanted to, um, the new one feels more cartoony than the older ones ever did. Um, the older ones, they were cartoony, right? <clears throat> or rather cartoonish but they had a level of grit to them that this game is missing um some levels do possess that grit still you get you know the the first level you get the sewers things like that um and streets of rage uh, like his difficulty it's always kind of balanced between um gritty and cartoony in a ways but it's always been more gritty than cartoony um, but now it seems like it's more cartoony than gritty and this this game even felt lighthearted whereas the previous ones especially three uh the ones before three um felt a little less grim than three did three just had so much craziness in it but uh number two and number one um they still had a nice level of grit to them especially the first one the second one more was a little more lighthearted, but the first one was especially uh especially gritty um, so I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, what else did I want to clear up? Um, this this review probably came off as a, a, a bit negative because uh, those are the things I focused on. Um, but I did want to let it be known that I had an overwhelmingly positive experience with this game. Uh, it was an absolutely fantastic game and I had nothing but a good time playing it. Um, even when I was pissed off, um, I was always wanting to play more of the game. Like even when I was pissed off fighting people like uh, Barbin with all the ads before I knew, way before I knew that breaking the bikes is what caused them to spawn. Um, things like that. And even only time I got like legit, like kind of fatigued on a game is once I did mania mode um, with, uh, with Axel. And I got a bit fatigued and I stopped playing the game for a little while. Um, other than that, I had nothing but a good time. Um, but other than that, let's see. I think I wanted to talk to you guys too about an incoming patch. That's uh, the center works. So uh, the game, it looks like is um, they are definitely working on a patch. Uh, the team that made the game, and um, I'm just trying to go back to the YouTuber who whose video I looked at uh, to check that out. Um, they let it be known that uh, they were they actually got to play it. Some of the uh, gameplay with uh, Axel and Cherry and he actually outlined a lot of the changes that are um, likely to be incoming and they appear to be very promising so I do want to give you guys that information so shout out to the youtuber Shin Kenso uh, I'm going to post a link so you guys can check out his um, actual test build footage that he did back at the um, the end of June uh, in, in this video he discussed possible changes to Axel when they look very promising um, when you guys watch this video, uh, this these things aren't set in stone, but these are possibilities that might be uh, going into effect. And if they all if they all come to come into fruition, then Axel is going to be a much more different monster to play as um, with improved uh, movement speed and offensive capability. So I do want you guys to check this video out um, just to see what you guys might be in for with the next uh, Street Rage 4 patch. So this is just the beginning of Streets of Rage 4. They're going to be adding a lot more to the game, I imagine. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I know, um, I know I'm pretty sure that there is DLC on the way as well as these balance patches that are on the way that are just going to make the game feel completely different from what it feels like right now. So I did want to share that with you guys so that um, my review wasn't, you know, you don't just take my review as gospel. It's just how I felt at the time. I'm just adding these addendums to the thing because, um, you know, because I think uh, I just want you guys to have like the full picture pretty much because uh, my opinion of the game is always is always changing. And uh, some of the things I said in the video, most I think mostly everything I've said in the video, I still feel that way. But uh, my opinion is, is becoming tweaked a little bit as I get better at the game as, and as I uh, hear new stuff about the game. So. Anyways, um, stay tuned. Keep tr keep track of this. Uh...
anyways uh stay tuned uh keep track of all streets rage for information and um yeah keep playing the game so take care guys this time is for real till next time peace